as an organization, when you're focused on clinical outcomes, when you're focused on making patients healthy or keeping them healthy, preventing and so on and so forth, you don't have to do anything additional to prove those outcomes to other entities that might be looking for outcomes. Hi, I'm Phyllis Schnabel, partner in Hydric and Struggles New York office and a member of the Healthcare and Life Sciences and Health Tech Practices. With the abundance of health tech companies offering single point solutions, all-encompassing platforms, or many Me Too products, customers and investors are seeking differentiation and demonstrated outcomes. Perhaps related, a trend we're seeing is the rising importance of the chief medical officer. Of the top 150 health tech firms on the CB Insights list, over a third have a CMO on their leadership team, and for more than two-thirds, it's their first one. As you'll find with our guest today, the chief medical officer is playing an increasingly critical role in product design and delivery, and even now extending beyond into policy, strategy, innovation, strategic partnerships, and even m and I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Vidya Ramon Tangela, chief medical officer at Teladoc, the global leader in providing telemedicine and virtual care across a wide range of needs. Vidya is responsible for leading the clinical vision at Teladoc and working to improve the health outcomes of its members. Prior to joining Teladoc Health, Dr. Ramon Tangela served as general manager of healthcare and life sciences solutions at AWS. Earlier, she held leadership roles at healthcare companies, including Blue Cross Blue Shield, Johnson & Johnson, and United Healthcare, and has spent many years leading the design of integrated health and wellness solutions for employers and healthcare plans. Dr. Ramon Tangela earned a Master of Health Administration degree from Cornell University and a Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery, and BBS degree from Osmana University in Hyderabad. Welcome, Vidya. Thank you for joining us today. No, thank you for having me. Fun. <laughs> Vidya, I'd say until well, maybe three to five years ago, we found investors were viewing chief medical officers as a luxury investment. And more recently, we're seeing the addition of the expertise that's top as actually integral to helping to de-risk the organization and create enterprise value. It seems that chief medical officers matter today and the role of the CMO has been evolving. Since you've been involved in tech-enabled clinical care delivery, how have you seen the purpose, application, and impact of the role change? And are they advisors, spokespersons, business drivers, or all of the above? They're a great question. So I think your question focuses mostly on tech-enabled companies, but if I think of where I began, right, and so even sitting inside large health insurance companies, pharma, life sciences, there was always a CMO or more, right? Sometimes CMOs associated at the business level as opposed to just at the enterprise level. So the role of the CMO has existed within healthcare, within the ecosystem, outside of the clinical realm. But I think particularly within the digital tech, health tech space, that has definitely evolved. Even across the board, whether you take, you know, the large companies to health tech, I would say that the role has probably gone from being solely clinical to becoming the bridge, the connector between the clinical world and all other worlds. What I mean by all other could be, you know, the product, right? Every tech company has a product. It could be the bridge to operations. It could be the bridge to really the engaging consumers. So I think the role is not just about focusing on core clinical functions like quality and policy and, you know, several of which you outlined, but also to look at how does clinical now translate and bridge into the other functions. And I think the other trend that we must also talk about in that context is we have gotten to a point where we're seeing more companies that are in healthcare that are tech enabled, as opposed to tech companies doing healthcare as a part of other businesses. You see what I mean? So, so now when you are a predominantly healthcare company, you're focused on care, but you happen to be technology enabled, you want to have clinicians. You want to have clinicians at the run because they can not only make sure that the strategy is right, but also help translate and apply the technology in ways that really matter to patients and populations. So you just gave quite a bit of an inside view. Let's look outside for a second, because one of the things that you and I were talking about was the external nature also of the CMOs on behalf of the company now. We talked a little bit about focusing externally on M&A and partnerships and wanting to make sure from a clinical perspective that those make sense. We also talked about keeping kind of eye on the horizon or ear to the ground on policy, government changes that are happening. Can you talk a little bit about the external nature of the CMO? Yeah, absolutely. So I think when you talk of partnerships and M&A, 
there always is that clinical component. Is there clinical alignment? Is there clinical basis on which we would like build a partnership or we would look at an m All of those are absolutely critical roles. I think those are all things that I certainly do and I know many other CMOs do. When it comes to policy, when it comes to all external audiences, right? So policy, customers, investors, analysts. Here's what I would say is that I think the first and foremost responsibility or attribute you can trust a CMO with is keeping the patient front and center. So if there is one person in the organization who you know will be held accountable and who wants to do nothing but the right thing by a patient, it would be the CMO. Not to say that others don't, but absolutely you can hold the CMO accountable. So whether you're sitting you know, with policymakers, whether you're sitting across from investors or you're even sitting across from a customer, what they want to know is that you have thought through things in a clinically sound manner. You've kept the patient front and center. You're focusing on outcomes. You're looking at quality. You're looking at safety. And then everything else can be discussed, right? So this is almost like that. That's the, I think, the huge value proposition. Again, this is not to say that nobody else in an organization can communicate this. But when it comes from a CMO, it just has that additional gravitas, if you will. So that's what I would say about those external facing roles. But also, again, even 20 years ago, CMOs used to be out there externally speaking, right? But perhaps, you know, what they're talking about and the context within which they are operating, the audiences that they interact with has definitely evolved. I think also we were talking about the changing in the investment community and the appetite for investment, even, you know, more recently, post-COVID, post-economy slowing down and all that. And I hear the word outcomes from you quite a bit. And I know that we've certainly been talking a lot about how we're hearing from investors that a good idea is not good enough. Product market fit is not good enough. And now many more investors are really kicking the tires. Customers too, certainly, but investors and are looking for demonstrated outcomes. Talk a little bit about how that's changed for you recently. Well, I think outcomes were always in focus. However, I do remember the time when I was on the other side of the fence inside these large organizations, talking to companies like the one that I am with today and saying, First, show me that you can enroll people. Okay, then show me you can keep those consumers engaged. So we were focused more because tech was something new within healthcare. And we didn't know what consumer receptivity would be to technology, as well as the application with the overall big picture. So we were willing back then to say, you know what, let's have you enroll people. Let's have you engage people. But those days are gone. I think the good news is when customers, investors and others look for outcomes associated with any tech-based product, they have implicitly said to you that this is here to stay. So in other words, if we didn't think that this can work, we're not going to be asking about outcomes. So I think the way I look at it is that we know that tech-enabled healthcare can deliver excellent outcomes. And so, you know, anybody, who, whether they're a buyer or other entities asking for outcomes, essentially is just an acknowledgement that that can happen. So Yes, you're right. I mean, I do see a huge movement towards that. And we take clinical outcomes. I take clinical outcomes very, very seriously. In fact, if you ask me, that is the North Star that anchors a lot of the work that we do, for instance, here at Teladoc Health. And for me personally, that's been a very, very important North Star. If what I do at the end of the day can have even a sliver of an impact on patient or population health, I will leave this world a better place. Let's just put it that way, right? And that's what I'm after personally. But also as an organization, I think anchoring after that. As an organization, when you're focused on clinical outcomes, when you're focused on making patients healthy or keeping them healthy, preventing and so on and so forth, you don't have to do anything additional to prove those outcomes to other entities that might be looking for outcomes. When you're not focused, then it becomes much more challenging to explain away those outcomes to others. But I would say that we're just so heavily focused on outcomes. So clinical, financial outcomes, adding up to value and so Yeah, it becomes a much bigger value proposition. And this might very naturally lead into the next question, which is, we'll think of the CMO as functioning as an agent of checks and balances. Hmm. So I'm wondering how this has worked for you, especially when it comes to leaders in product or the commercial side or, or even investors. How do you balance speed, quality and value? I say that my job and my team's responsibility is to ensure that everything we create in the form of solutions and services are clinically sound. What I mean by that is that there has to be one team or at the very least in a small company, one individual who's worried about 
and staying up wondering how to bring the latest and greatest in science into what they do. I mean, from when I went to med school to now, science has changed a lot. So, you know, there is an important responsibility right there to like make sure that all of the advances in clinical science and data science are incorporated into the product. So I would say as a team, the clinical, the CMO, CMO team becomes responsible for the clinical soundness, the clinical desirability of a solution or a service. I think of the three prongs tool, desirability, feasibility, and viability. So you want to do something that is clinically desirable. So if you were a doctor, what would you do for this patient? That's the question that we keep asking over and over again. If I have a patient who looks like this, what am I going to focus on? What am I going to do? So it's no different. And that's exactly what we do as we think of how we design our solutions. So that piece has to be looked at and the rest of the organization has to be able to feel comfortable that, okay, that's been looked at, so nobody else needs to worry about it. Now you layer in the feasibility and the viability piece, which is where all the other teams come in. When I think of the product team, when I think of the operations team, or a team that, like, for instance, we have a Teladoc Health who is held responsible for engaging consumers, right? So these are all the people who take this clinical foundation and bring it to life through a product in the way we operationalize and in the way we engage people. And then eventually there's the viability piece, which is again, going back to the outcomes. So clinical outcomes, which then translate into cost savings and revenues and so on and so forth. So it's that three prongs stool. And I don't know if I think of it as checks and balances as much as I think of it as a partnership and clarity in and relying on each other for what we can do really well. So I don't want to be doing what a product team would do really, really well but I do want to partner with them. We have a phenomenal team, for instance, that can engage people, that has all the rails, as they would call it, to engage people. So we need, I need to be able to trust them and work in partnership. So I think it's a partnership model more than anything else. And it takes time to get to that understanding, to build that credibility and say, okay, this is how we're going to work as an ecosystem. Well, Midya, that again leads right into my next question, which is about stakeholder management. <laughs> so you talk about these different groups, but I'm curious when you're at this level and at the point, kind of this nexus where you are as the chief medical officer, who are your most important stakeholders and where do they sit along these critical pathways and how do you manage relationships with them so that you can find alignment and you can maintain forward progress? So I would say internal and external stakeholders, internal stakeholders, I would say First and foremost, I mean, it's my responsibility, our responsibilities towards the patients, right? And so that's who we take seriously. So I think that's the one number one thing that I ask myself, my team, what would we do? What's the right thing for this patient? So I would say number one stakeholder is the patient. And then internally, like I said before, it's the product team, especially in a tech-enabled organization. For the technology product to become a vehicle through which we take clinical solutions and approaches to the patient, that close partnership is very critical. And so there's the product. Then we have the operations team, and that includes anybody from the doctors that are actually delivering the care to the coaches, to the therapists and others that actually provide the care. So the whole operating mechanism. Then we have, like I said, the within the marketing team, the team that basically works on engaging people. Data science is another critical stakeholder. And if you're wondering, well, how do we work with them? If we're able to articulate to our data science team that hey, in a patient that looks like this, this is what we want to know. And at such and such frequency, in order to do X, it becomes easy for them to then tell you how to create, architect that particular approach from a data science model. So that's how you work in partnership because it's impossible for me to know how to manipulate and handle data. It's almost impossible for them to know what would work and why. And so Translating becomes a very important function. So I would say data science. So those are some big, you know, internal stakeholders. Certainly our legal teams, government affairs teams, because, you know, you may want to do some things that in a virtual world, it's actually a lot harder, right? There are so many rules and regulations to abide by. So they become important stakeholders. I talked about viability earlier. So the financial aspects of it. So we're living in the world of value-based care, right? So how do we take all of these clinical models and clinical pathways and care models and really align them with value-based care. So another important stakeholder are those people who are coming up with all of those mechanisms to risk stratify, understand populations, apply the care models, and then apply the performance guarantee. So many, many stakeholders and externally, like I said, patient first and foremost, but also all of the customers who very quickly turn into partners because 
what works for one may not work for another. So it's that tailoring. And so they are important stakeholders still in my mind. I would imagine as a physician, people skills are a big part of it. And it sounds like what you've just outlined, relationships matter to get Mm -hmm. things done. Sitting inside a corporate organization, are there any leadership capabilities that helped you as a practicing physician that have also helped you as more of a corporate chief medical officer? And are there any new capabilities you had to develop to sit in a different seat? I'm learning on a daily basis. So let's get that out of the way. So I would say what I've kept with me and I think what helps tremendously is, I mean, there are many, but the key ones to me would be empathy, the ability to communicate and connecting the dots. If you think of what a doctor does on a daily basis, patient by patient, right? Empathizing with them, asking away all the right questions, clarifying, communicating, but then also trying to connect the dots. Hmm, what might be going on? Like analyzing, right? So those, I think, have now become part of my DNA. So I, I'd be hard-pressed to imagine a day when those don't come into being on a daily basis. But along the way, I would say, I don't know if I'd call them skills as much as I would think of them as a good understanding. So I don't need to be a technologist. I don't need to be an expert in finance. I don't need to be so many things, but I do need to understand all of those. I do need to understand how the product, whether it's in this organization or all, like when I was at Amazon AWS, what did they do? What were their products? That understanding is critical for me then to translate those products to deliver clinical value. So to know, to understand, so maybe it's a skill, but it's how do you understand all of these other areas, even operations, like how does that whole machinery work, right? And I learn something new on a daily basis about every one of these functions. So I would say those are the key areas around which you have to build your understanding so that you can be a much better team player. And the value that you provide is, you know, way beyond just the core clinical. So now you're able to become that bridge to all of these other other functions as well. And we talk about a lot of other functions that when you were, I were talking, I was quite surprised and enlightened about the variety and scale of the teams that sit under you as chief medical officer. And I'm just curious, you've been in a couple of different types of organizations. You're sitting in a significant health tech company now. Can you talk a little bit about the teams that fall underneath you in these, you know, kind of large scale and growing health tech companies and how that kind of evolution of your span of control has changed? Mm -hmm. I would say here, I mean, at Teladoc Health, I have first and foremost responsibilities for what we call enterprise clinical strategy. As you're aware, I'm sure we're not just about urgent care. We do everything from prevention, primary care to urgent care or slash acute to chronic condition management, mental health. So we can take care of patients and populations across the spectrum and along the journey. So an enterprise clinical strategy is about what is that overarching value proposition. And it doesn't have to be a one size fits all where you're bringing everything to bear for everybody, but you really tailor what a patient needs based on, again, insights from the data. So the enterprise clinical strategy essentially hinges on focusing on clinical outcomes and is driven by insight. So I have that. And so that was something that I put together very quickly after I got here. Underneath that, I would say now, since we're in mental health, what's our overall mental health strategy? So I have responsibility for that. I have responsibility for our strategy within cardiometabolic health, primary care. I could go on and on, but essentially think of like, what is the clinical strategy behind everything that we do as a standalone offering, as well as at the enterprise level? I also oversee the health equity function, our chief health equity officer. That's the role that I created after I started here, hired her, and she's awesome. Now, when we talk of health equity, I like to think of health equity as being an integral component of everything we do so that we're driving towards those outcomes. So health equity is not a separate function. It starts by understanding, you know, who we are serving so that we can improve our experience and access so that we drive towards outcomes. So we want to be able to deliver equitable care. And so that's what we're focused on with that. I oversee the clinical quality and patient safety functions. We have an incredible chief clinical quality officer. And so we take these functions, these are job zero for us without quality and safety, you know, you may as well pack up. So we take that seriously. And so those functions fall under me. And and also remember, we are global. So many of these, to the extent that there are international components, there's that angle as well to the role. So where it's bringing about, I don't want to use the word standardization when it comes to safety. Every country has to do what they need to do. And what we're trying to do is basically simplify and cross-pollinate and share. 
So, but I do oversee these functions, you know, even outside the U.S. Clinical research is another, as you can imagine, we're sitting on like a ton of data. It's one thing to use the data to understand how we're doing and of course, push us more and more towards outcomes. And it's also another opportunity to look at data at the aggregate level and then understand what we can actually glean from that and share more across the healthcare ecosystem. So clinical research as a function is something that I oversee as well. And then I talked about value-based care earlier. So the clinical strategy behind value-based care. How do you go about it? Because it's very, very different in a virtual environment. And it's also important to remember it's not going to be entirely virtual, right? It's going to be a hybrid model. So what are those care models? What do those partnerships look like? So those become critical. Last but not the least, I have responsibility for the quality committee of our board. So where I meet with our board members every quarter and share, learn, discuss. So yeah, those are some of the functions I oversee. But it's a very matrixed organization, like I said before, those close bridges with all of the other teams that may not be clinical, but we all need to work together in order to deliver the value. So do you mind if we come back, though, to help that? But I'm curious to dig in just a little bit more on that mm-hmm. because it's a newer concept and it's not one that is necessarily standardized. It's like the word digital. People use the word, but it means different things to different people. Mm-hmm. I'd just love to hear a little bit of perspective on how you think about health equity there at Teladoc mm-hmm. and what it means to you, because I think it's mm-hmm. new and we're all shaping it right mm-hmm. now. So health equity, I mean, if you look at the definition, it is basically the opportunity for anybody to achieve the best possible health outcomes without any discrimination or without consideration of things like social determinants of health, culture, race, ethnicity, gender, and so on and so forth, right? So if any two people have the same opportunity to achieve the health outcomes, regardless of all of these metrics, then we can say we have some health equity. So what it really means is that we have to, in an ongoing manner, be mindful of, understand They're called social determinants, but we think of them as social drivers of health. I mean, believe it or not, those drive 55 to 60% of one's health. For some of us, we take it for granted, right? We don't have to worry about food on the table. We don't have to worry about housing or education or a job. But for those for whom this is a big deal, it has a direct impact on their health. So it does account for 55 to 60% of one's health. Then you have things like race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, and so on and so forth. Then you have the ability to provide equitable care. So the first set are all the attributes that are maybe at a patient and a consumer level. And then there is the system, the other side of the house, right? So from a provider, from a care delivery standpoint, are we able to provide equitable care? So for instance, at Teladoc, we talk about, do we have doctors, coaches, therapists, even employees, that resemble the people that we're serving, right? Do we have diversity amongst ourselves so that we can really relate? And so are you in a position to provide equitable care? So that's not just who you hire, but it is also about understanding who you're serving. So if I know who I'm serving through data, then I can be mindful of certain things and I can attempt to provide equitable care. But if I'm totally blind to these, then I probably am not going to be able to provide equitable care. So health equity basically has both these dimensions, right? It's all the data that tell us who a person is or a population is, and then there is the ability to provide equitable care. So the two have to come together in order for us to drive health equity. So the way we think of marching towards that is looking at actionable data. So who am I serving? How am I doing? What am I doing well? What am I not doing well? What do I need to do differently? How is the experience? Are we offering the same experience to everybody? Is it different for different people? Is it better for some and not so good for some others? Let's correct that. Let's look at access. Just because there is broadband, it doesn't mean it's affordable. So are we talking affordable access? Are we talking equitable access? So what do we mean by access? You know, proximity to a provider, proximity to anything at all, proximity to healthy food. So we look at access. And eventually we look at outcomes, right? So how are we doing across the population and are certain populations getting left behind? There are also so many other nuances, like within the clinical world, there are algorithms that we use to assess risk of certain conditions. Many of them skew unfavorably towards certain populations. So a big part of health equity is also understanding where that might be happening, not because somebody wanted to do it this way, but this is how we conceived of it back then, but now we know different. 
we're actually working even at that level to say, okay, let's look at all of those algorithms. Let's see how we look at populations. So it's a very, very hands-on, broad, deep effort. Yes, there's a chief health equity officer, but guess what? She works across the organization. As you can imagine, data science, product, engagement team, operations team, the clinical strategy folks, right? And the outcomes teams to say, okay, this is how we need to influence everything. So hope that helps. It's a big deal. Let's put it that way. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very big deal. It's a very big deal. Mm-hmm. So did you able to change course a little bit? You were telling me that you recently spoke at Harvard Medical School to a broad set of med students. And you talked about the role of the chief medical officer and how it's evolving and could be a potential career path right from graduation versus most of the ones that are senior level roles now came in after practicing. I would love for you to share what advice you shared with them. (laughs) It was a fun group, fascinating group. And it's interesting. I was in their shoes at one point, but I didn't realize that I was in their shoes. And so it's always very interesting when you meet these aspiring not just doctors, but doctors who want to have an impact through so many different things. Anyway, so this was a group that was basically considering not just medicine, but perhaps medicine and MD and an MBA or entrepreneurship, right? So it was a very eclectic group. I shared my own journey with them. So before I was even eligible to give them advice, I thought it was important for me to share with them what my journey looked like. And I call it forks on the road. And basically, my message to them was that I didn't plan a single thing. Okay, it wasn't like I said, okay, I'm going to take a left turn here and a right turn. But when it came, I was open enough. I was courageous enough to say, okay, I think I'm going to go try it. Most work, some didn't. I failed. That's okay. So I think that sharing my journey kind of unraveled other things in that group that I was talking to. But my main message to them was, broaden your perspectives. In fact, I was talking to one of the students as a follow-up yesterday. She set up a one-on-one call. And I said, you know, you're sitting in Harvard, for heaven's sake. So you have access to so much. Broaden your perspectives. Go meet, like, understand the world of bioinformatics. Understand health tech. You're sitting right next to MIT. So broaden the perspective. So even as you are training to be a doctor, you're looking at all of these perspectives And then when it's time, you can make a decision whether you want to take care of sick patients by doing a certain thing. Do you want to go into the world of prevention? Do you want to go into technology? So there are options are many. So I think just helping them understand that they are a very, very different breed of doctors than, you know, what we were. And they have so much at their fingertip that they can actually leverage to really broaden their perspectives, but also think about how they may add value differently. So I even had a one slide, I think, when I said, you can become the CEO of a company at some point, right? And so it was interesting. And many of them asked me about the skills. Like you asked me, what are the skills? Like, how did I develop them? And I said, listen, it's not so much the technical skills, it's all the other skills that will really come in handy. I do think that going forward, the doctor of the future, the more they can prepare themselves to take in data-driven insights, whether it comes from the patient, whether it comes from a health plan, the better they will be as doctors. Because today, if you think about it, you know, doctors have the data that they have access to, but they don't have access to so much else that can actually help them do much better in terms of managing the patients. And so that was something that we talked quite a bit about. But it was fascinating, really, really fascinating. (laughs) Well, it's interesting. I'll talk to them early in their career about kind of different forks in the road and career pathing. And that's a question I had for you as we work with executives who are established in their careers, we tend to see chief medical officers, like some other more functional experts, like CFOs and others, but they tend to be best athletes. You know, they are very focused on what they do well, and they do it at one organization, another organization, another organization, kind of like, you know, Mm. trading teams, if you will, versus being on a career path into general management, CEO, et cetera. Mm. What's your experience and what have you seen in your peer group as potential career pathing for CMOs, especially in the world of health tech? That's an interesting question. So I sit on a cross healthcare group, a CMO forum, where we have CMOs that are inside health plans, that are inside employer organizations, hospitals, health systems, pharma, life sciences, retail, tech, a whole host. I don't think the roles are the same in each of these organizations. I'm pretty sure because I do come across quite a few job descriptions, let's put it that way. So it's not the same. So if you're sitting in a hospital health system, 
what is expected of you may be very different from what is expected of you when you're sitting in an organization which is purely tech-based, right? And even if I think of my own role across whether it was called a CMO or not, the value proposition is kind of different. And so you just have to make sure that as an individual, regardless of the title, at least for me, what's been important is to make sure that I'm able to add value to the organization. If I cannot add value, if I cannot shape something differently by being who I am, then it's probably not the right role. So I think for a CMO, I think it's totally okay for somebody who's been a CMO within a health tech company to go to a hospital and health system because that's definitely a different role and you get a different experience, provided you want to do that, provided you can add value. Pharma life science is, again, very, very different, right? And so there's that. But I also think CMOs can evolve into larger strategy roles. So you can become the CSO for a company that is providing clinical care. You could become the head of innovation that may be primarily clinically driven. You could become the CEO of a company. Why not, right? And especially if we're saying that health tech is here to stay and healthcare of the future is going to include and involve a healthy dose of technology and such, any tech company that is run by a clinician who is a CEO can just be, I think, incredibly successful. I think even today we have examples where doctors are at the helm and running companies that are tech enabled and that are in the care space. There are people, I know it's not me, but some of my colleagues who love operations and you could do that too. You can head up operations. So yeah, I think that there's just numerous possibilities. Yeah. I don't know about you, but I think when I do see a physician at the helm and a CEO, they're often sitting from a founder perspective versus <laughs> having kind of worked their way up, if you will. They had the first brilliant idea and then surrounded themselves with people to operationalize yeah. and commercialize it. Yeah, that is very much true today, but I'm hoping that that changes. So there is an intentional and a deliberate effort made to bring a clinician on as a CEO. Now, obviously, remember, then as a CEO come a whole host of responsibilities. So one must be willing to do that. There are people that love that. There are people that say, no, you know what? I know what I can be really good at. I can add value that way, never mind the CEO title. So I think it's important to know who you are, what makes you tick, what's your pers personal mission. So, yeah. So as we bring our podcast to a close, I have one final question. And again, it's along the lines of what we've been talking about, but the future. Where do you see the future of health tech heading? And do you see the role of chief medical officer further evolving and changing? Or, And if so, how? Oh, gosh, I wish I could tell you how. I know it will evolve because it has evolved. So I'm optimistic that it will evolve and it'll evolve in the right direction and in bigger ways. I don't know the answer to how, but I think the role will become continue to be important, if not more important. I think health tech and especially technology that also has something to do with leveraging data. So this technology for the sake of technology, but I'm also a very big believer in the power of data, right? So technology that either generates data or can enable the data to become a powerful component of prevention, management, and so on and so forth, those I think will become much bigger in the future. So definitely here to stay. That's what I'm saying is that tech-enabled care, I think, is here to stay. I can't imagine a single aspect of our life today that is not influenced by technology. Look at anything at all. And we've kind of seamlessly brought it in. We aren't thinking of it as, oh, this is tech enabled and this is not tech enabled. It's just who we are. I think we need to get there with healthcare. We're not yet there. We still talk in terms of, oh, there's a tech enabled and then there's non tech enabled traditional healthcare. I think it'll be one. I think healthcare will be one that includes that entire ecosystem and a big part of that ecosystem will be the tech enabled. So, the role of the chief medical officer, I think, really will depend on where in the ecosystem they are. But fundamentally, I would think of them as either strong clinicians who can translate clinical science, clinical medicine to a technology team or related teams, or they can actually be the ones that can drive the technology itself to become of greater clinical value. So you, know, you could start with the technology and say, okay, what do I do with this? that can meet a need within the clinical space. Or you can say, hey, clinically, these are the needs and unmet needs and gaps we have. How can technology solve for it? So I think both of those will become fundamental. Depending on the nature of the company, the size of the company, that role could be sitting inside product or it could be the CMO or even the CEO. So, But I do think it will evolve for sure. So you and I will stay very busy for the next several years, yes? <laughs> well, Midya, I can't thank you enough for making time for us today. It's been an absolute delight. You've shed a new light 
on the evolving role of the chief medical officer. And it has been educational, insightful, and as always fun. So thank you so much for spending time with us. Thank you, Phyllis. You're always fun to talk to. So thank you. My pleasure. 